We'll gather, let's say, five questions and comments, and then we'll ask the panelists to respond. Thank you so much. Um, my name is Judith Rius, and I'm the US manager of the Access to Essential Medicines campaign of Doctors Without Borders, Medicines and Frontiers. Uh, this has been a very interesting panel, um, and I have so many things to say that it's going to be difficult for me to summarize keep it. Keep yourself to two minutes. Okay, that's two minutes. Our, that's okay. our rule so that we the can first keep point the movement. that I will make, uh, and with the hope of not being too critical, is that in, I think this is a very interesting conversation. You have very high-level people in the panel and a very informed positions, but I think it will be good for, good for the future to have somebody in the panel who provides maybe a, a, a different perspective, maybe more critical uh, on the current on the current systems and the way it works. Maybe somebody from civil society, or even from a developing country, um, who are basically the, the main beneficiaries. They're supposed to be the main beneficiaries of these mechanisms. Um, and in general, um, uh, as you, are, I'm sure you well know, uh, Doctors with the Borders have quite a critical position on, 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 the, on the design of the advanced market commitment, not on the idea of uh, the advanced market commitment, and not at all on Gavi. We, are, uh, we understand the benefits of uh, having this kind of conversations. We just have uh, some concerns on the final design of the advanced market commitment. And we think uh, there were basically a lot of compromises that were made in the final design. And we think these, design, these compromises could have been avoided with, uh, and could be avoided if Gavi undergoes some, uh, some governance reform. Uh, just, uh, I have the quote. <coughs> Excuse me. I have some documentation with me that I would love to share with you. There are some of our proposals, but basically, in three grand lines, and it's basically a question and a comment to the to the to the panel is first um, the conflicts of interest that cause the fact that pharmaceutical companies are part of the Gavi board at this moment, and basically one of our ask with other organizations is pharmaceutical companies should not be part of the Gavi board because they are basically beneficiary in the AMC of a subsidy not to innovation but yes to ex escalate production. So we think part of the of the idea that they are beneficiaries of this uh, of this subsidy uh, makes them ineligible to be part of the board of Gavi. The second is the issue of price transparency. We know that from AIDS and other diseases, we have benefited a lot from having more transparency on the prices that institutions pay uh, for the final products. It would be good. We think that Gavi used this opportunity to um, to announce some government reforms that include more transparency on the pricing. And third, um, uh, this idea that uh, tier pricing, that's basically the concept uh, behind the advanced market commitment is the solution uh, to, to guarantee uh, long-term sustainability and access to the final products is, as you know, in their strong criticism uh, and strong discussion, uh, among other forums at the World Health Organization, where there is an expert working group on innovative financing and incentive mechanisms that's currently discussing incentive mechanisms that the link or separate the cost of R&D from the price of the final products, uh, and they promote competition and a, a, a variety of sources of supply. So why Gavi, or if Gavi is considered, my question would be, is Gavi considering and, and the promoters of the AMC and new incentive mechanisms, these three ideas, basically, avoiding conflicts of interest, increasing levels of transparency on the prices, and exploring incentive mechanisms that rely on a strong competition and, and rely on the link in the cost of R&D from the price of the product. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you for being so concise. Can I collect uh, four more? Other comments, questions? Come on, guys. You're getting close to the end. The green? <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, so the question has to uh, to uh, Michael Kremer about his argument about sort of using all of the funding at the beginning rather than thinking about um, additional entrance to market. It's it, If I understood what you were saying, you were saying we could have gotten more benefit by releasing all the AMC funds quickly. And I just wanted to ask the panel to comment on this sort of long-term supply and keeping price, prices down over the foreseeable future by having more um, manufacturers in the AMC versus the argument that Michael Kremer was making. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Others? Okay, well, let's take a round of response and maybe people will get inspired. Uh, we'll start with Michael. Great, uh, thanks. Uh, so I, I, I can't really comment on the issue of uh, pharma companies on the, on the Gavi board. They, um, I, I don't think, you know, pharma companies were not part of the uh, expert, expert groups that, uh, certain, that certainly I was involved in. Um, on the price transparency, certainly the advanced market commitment, it's 
up on the web what the prices are. So I think the advanced market commitments are, are transparent. Uh, more generally, you know, there is a, there is a principle in industrial organization, the, the study of markets and economics, that trends that uh, that often pub sometimes firms can collude by having their prices published. So they're obviously yeah, because then they can immediately find if anybody's making a discount, and they uh, and they can use that to keep prices high. So it's not unambiguous. Obviously, in, in many settings, there's a huge corruption danger, and then publishing prices is, is good. That I'm not that. With Gabby, that doesn't seem, uh, you, you might think that, that, uh, that that's not the primary consideration. Um, Thanks very much. Um, on the issue of uh, tiered pricing and of, on the issue of competition, I think we can all agree that competition is very desirable. The question is, what stage does the competition come in? And the competition doesn't, it depends a lot on the specifics of the industry, whether it makes sense to have the competition for the, at, at the, on a day-to-day -day basis in a spot market context. So let me be a little bit more specific. If you're thinking about an industry where you need a huge upfront investment, and then the cost of production is, is much lower for each, each, uh, each additional uh, uh, unit, then it doesn't necessarily make sense to structure the competition all on a spot market basis. So an obvious example of that is electricity. Okay? We, need a, we need electricity is the solution, and we need a, re just like vaccines, although you know, less importantly, we need a reliable uh, supply of electricity. It takes a lot of work to build an electric power plant. It's a, it's a huge expense. So is the solution to say, let's build 10 times as many electric power plants as we need to satisfy, uh, we install capacity to satisfy 10 times the market need, and then let's have, have competition. Well, that's a very, somebody ultimately has to pay for it. You know, I, I, we all like to get more than a dollar's from a dollar's worth of, uh, of investment, and sometimes that's, sometimes that's possible, but there's also a principle that eventually things have to be paid for. So if you're going to install 10 times as much electric capacity, a, and build all those factories, it's ultimately society has to pay for it. Similarly, um, if, 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 so having the competition at the end of the game, and in a spot market sense, is a very expensive thing to get because you have to cause, cause those investments to be made in the first place. Similarly for vaccines, I think there's a, you know, we've relied on this, this model of saying, we're going to have spot, we're going to have very, the old way of doing things was, very short-run contracts. We're going to buy vaccines on a short-run contract, an annual contract for one year's worth of supply. Well, then, you know, then you think, well, we have to subsidize a lot of capacity creation. So we get, you know, firms out there with the capacity to produce more than we need, and then that's the only way we're going to get a decent price. Because obviously, if you've only got a small amount of capacity, a competition isn't really going to reduce the price. Well, I think that's ultimate. You, I think it's important to think about: is that really the best way to do it? We can free things up a lot um, by moving away from that model of lots of short-run contracts where ultimately you're going to have to pay for it anyway by building up capacity that you, you don't need, perhaps inefficiently. An alternative is to say, let's have a long-run contract. We'll still have the competition, but we'll have the competition up front and for who gets that long-run contract. That's you know, one way to think about what the advanced market commitment for pneumococcus is, is through that. Now look. I wouldn't go so far as to say that the whole market should be allocated once and for all. You know, in one, you know, we're going to allocate the whole Gabby market in one fell swoop. But there's roughly 200 million doses that are going to be needed. Okay. The decision, the as far, I thought that the that the uh, all the things I'd seen had talked about allocating 100 million doses of supply. A, you know, the, the early things that I had seen, I think this was a compromise that was made that was made in, you know, was, was probably made in the wrong direction. They were going to allocate 100 million do doses initially and then put up for, for bid the next 100 million doses. I think that next 100 million doses would have been plenty for the, you know, for other, to motivate other vaccine manufacturers. Also, as, as I understood it, and I don't know the final design, the, there isn't a commitment you know, the, the companies make a commitment, they're going to supply, they're going to be stand ready to supply at 350 a dose in the tail period. But that doesn't mean that Gavi's obligated to buy from them. If, if in fact, Gavi, another supplier comes along who can supply at a dollar a dose, Gavi can buy from them. So if there is somebody out there who's got a, got a I think there would have been plenty of incentive to develop new products, plenty of uh, incentive to, to have additional entrance uh, for, in the long run with 100 million doses reserved 
and with the prospect of, of if you can beat the 350 price, then 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 you know then you can get the whole market potentially. Um, I don't think the I don't think for some sort of hypothetical benefit we should have said we're only gonna we're gonna you know take a big risk uh, uh, of what I showed on those projections, which is countries willing to introduce the vaccine, kids dying from the disease, and not being able to get the vaccine for them because we we wanted to you know we wanted to hold on to the market. So I would have said. Allocate half the market now, half the market later on. Okay. Thanks, Michael. Sorry David, do you want to, or Helen? So, I mean, on the uh, governance issues, I'll leave that to Helen to address. Um, I mean, to pick up on Michael's discussion um, and the question of, you know, the quantities under the AMC, I would just say two things. I mean, the first is, um, just, I think I'm right in saying, as an empirical matter, you know, Amanda, if you take a look at the, at the history of all of the vaccines mm -hmm. that Gabby has been involved in, um, what's happened is that you've had this um, phenomenon where, um, you know, the market has been increased by Gabby agglomerating demand. Um, more uh, suppliers have come to that particular market. Um, you know, at the beginning stages, the price has sort of... Uh, you know, trended upward slightly, probably, or stayed where it is. And then as you get more market entrance, the price has trended downwards. Um, so the AMC, I think, is in a sense, is, 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 a, is a pressure cooker environment where it's trying to foreshorten that whole process. That's, that's one observation to make. Now, having said that, I mean, I think that the fundamental point that Michael makes is around a very difficult judgment call, and one could make it either way. That's, I think, is the fundamental point. It's a judgment call, and it, I think it's difficult to talk about right or wrong here, but that, that is an important input. I think the next thing to say is just at a theoretical level, as well as at an empirical level, you're right. I mean, there is, you know, the, the, the market for pneumo is neither a market for electricity nor is it a market for toothpaste. Market for electricity being one where it's characterized by, by and large, in most countries, competition for the market rather than competition in the market. And the market for toothpaste being competition in the market, a full spot market market for vaccines is not quite either of those, but where, but I think what, in my mind, one way to look at the AMC is that it's moving you from a world where you start with competition for the market, and you're quite right, um, particularly when you're looking at long-term supply, that's awfully important, but hopefully you get to a point where it drifts more towards a spot market, where you have sufficient, sufficient competition in the market that it looks more like a, like a spot market, and some electricity markets have obviously traveled that that journey, not all the way to toothpaste, but um, and sometimes with end runs in the middle. But I mean, it, they have they have. So that's that's the next thing uh, I would say. And the final thing I would say is that you know one of the one of the elements that goes into making the judgment call, and I'm not defending. I'm just saying one of the elements that goes into the judgment call about how much do you call for, how much do you contract, is the credibility behind that. And bear in mind the AMC is partly the 1.5 billion that is collected in the donor AMC pool. But as you know, the other part is what comes through Gabby funds. And Gabby is precisely, as Helen said, we're in the middle of a replenishment round. So uh, there's, there's only so much that we can credibly stand behind. And we need to transmit that credibility to industry if these uh, calls for proposals are actually going to hold. Helen. Thanks. Uh, yes, a couple of comments. I mean, we're, we're very, very aware uh, with MSF's concerns. I think in terms of governance, uh, Gabby's a public-private partnership, and the principle of a public-private partnership is you put all the key players around the table, and this is about vaccines. So uh, there was a decision made that there should be manufacturers represented in the public-private partnership that's Gavi, and then you manage the conflicts of interest by a strong conflict of interest policy about where it's appropriate uh, for a person to be involved in the discussions and where it's not appropriate to be involved in the discussions. I think looking at conflict of interest is something that the board uh, is, is looking at on an ongoing basis. There's a retreat next week, and I know that conflict of interest generally and, and how we manage it uh, in both the board and the committees is something the board will be addressing. Um, but I think with a public-private partnership, with the principle of putting all the players around the table, there are inevitably conflicts. It's how you manage those conflicts. One could argue that you shouldn't have developing countries on the board because they're recipients. Um, one could argue, uh, you know, a range. Uh, uh, we have WHO and UNICEF on the board. They also receive Gavi funds. So it's it's a question of how you manage those conflicts. Uh, so I, I 
I think that's what, what I would comment there. Um, in terms of price transparency, uh, UNICEF is the procurement agent for Gabi, uh, and UNICEF, we've had discussions with them over the last period. Um, they All the prices are on the UNICEF website now. The Gavi prices are there. Uh, so going forward, any contracts will have it as, uh, as part of the contract, that those prices will be on the UNICEF website. And to have retrospective prices up there, it requires the manufacturer's approval because it's a, it's a retrospective decision. But, but we are indeed, um, uh, with UNICEF, our procurement agent, making sure uh, transparency. Bearing in mind Michael's comments about there are, there are downsides of that transparency as well. Um, I don't think I'll comment. I'm not an economist myself, and I think that Michael has more than adequately covered that, and, and David has also covered it. But I, I just think uh, perhaps an example of uh, judgment calls, and there's no right or wrong answer, was Michael's comment about too small a volume in terms of going out, um, and the decision that was made, as I understand it, was to allow capacity for other other manufacturers to come in. I know there's been some concern expressed that uh, the the tender at the time went to two, the two big pharma companies. Um, they happened to be the only companies at that time who met the qualification requirements and who had the capacity to produce the volume we wanted because supply has been a problem. Um, but by not releasing uh, all the volume over the long term, um, that allows capacity. We're going out to tender again in the next couple of months actually and we'll go out several times more, which gives the capacity for new manufacturers to come in and we we understand there are a couple of emerging market manufacturers coming in, and it also gives the opportunity for the price to go down. But once again, there's a downside to it. So I think this is about judgment calls. Mm -hmm. Can you say anything on that topic? Okay. Or do we have last questions from the audience? Or okay. Well, let's wrap up then. Thank you so much to our panelists. I think this is a very substantive discussion that laid out some key issues and um, set out the challenges that you're facing going ahead. So thanks very much for coming and thanks to the audience for coming. Thank you.